updates. I hit reload, but I guess it uh screwed me over. It's been updated. Oh well, you get the gist of it. <laughs> anyway, all right. So let's see what's up. What's up? What's up? Um, oh, we got a little bounce. He's on the S and P, the Nasdaq with a big bounce all the way back to thirteen two almost. So everything is hunky dory at the moment. No, no big uh, sell off yet. <clears throat> That's not the Dow, so YM, that was Chipotle. There's the Dow with its little bounce, so things are not so bad. How's the, how's the, uh, the VIX doing is a very important question. So the VIX went up to 26 and back down to 23, so it's calmed down quite a bit. <clears throat> Still volatile, but not getting worse. You know, when the VIX is getting worse, you know, you got problems. When it starts going up and up, you've got a feeling it's going to be a drop. And so the VIX stopped going up at 1030, and we stopped going down at 1030. See how that works? So it's another, this is another reason it should be an indicator if you're a futures trader. Got to keep your eye on the VIX. Got to keep your eye on the dollar. Got to keep your eye on, uh, I always like to watch, well, here's a dollar. This dollar thing is useless, though, on Pink or Swim these days. And um, got to keep your eye, I always watch oil and gas and gold and silver also. And that gives you a good idea when things are trending one way or another. And it's very important as far as the dollar. I mean, I still watch the little number here. But with the dollar, you just want to get an idea of if it's turning or something or changing. Here's the futures. No, that's not the futures. <clears throat> So the dollar, a little bounce off of 89.70, but really, on the whole, that's just a weak bounce for the dollar, right? So here you are coming down from 91.50 or 91.40. Um, coming down 91.40 to 89.80 is what, 160? Well, let's say, yeah, I would call that consolidation up there. So 89.80 to 91.40 is 160. And that means you're going to be looking at a, a 30 point rise. So 90 10, right? Basically, right here is a weak bounce. So that's what a weak bounce looked like. It was rejected pretty harshly up there. <coughs> a strong bounce is 90 60. Good luck with that. Is that right? 91 40, 89 80. <clears throat> is 160 right so 30 points so that'd be oh that'd be 90 10 and then 90 40 yeah that's a it looks bigger than a strong bounce but it's not okay so that's there's and, and interestingly you can see how the strong bounce line was significant right it was significant on the way down and 90 10 also significant it formed the channel over here so you see what happened here you have this channel of 90 10 to 90 40 the weak bounce to strong bounce lines so before they were even hit, before you set your bottom, you had this weak and strong bounce lines. You could almost predict where the where you'd fall to if you worked, you know, you could work the math backwards, right? You're saying, well, if we're bouncing here, therefore we must be bouncing from, and that and that's how you know where your uh, your next inflection point is going to be, basically. So you know, so now of course we don't know that we don't know that this isn't forming a bottom. You don't know for sure that that, that you're not forming an actual bottom here. And then that this becomes a bounce off of that. So if we calculated this, 90, 40 to 90 is 40 points. And then we would have had bounces of eight, which would be eight, not very, not very high. Um, wait, 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 wait. No, I'm doing that wrong. 91, 40. That's why I'm doing it wrong. 91, 40 to 90 is 140. And then your bounce would be 28. You have the same, basically the same 30 point bounces. So you go from there to 30 and you can see how here you got a little bit of consolidation on this area here it seems like a line and then 60 would be the next line <clears throat> so then you bounced up you went stronger than stronger than a strong bounce over here but then fell back below it and once you fall back below it once you once you violate the second time you are probably going down <clears throat> so that brings us to the nasdaq And what's the NASDAQ been doing? We went from 14, if we went back further, but we can't, um, not like that. But anyway, certainly from 14, so that's not a question. <clears throat> so we went from 14 to 13, and we knew that. I you know, That we predicted beforehand. We said it was going to fall 1,000 points. 
So 14 to 13 is 1,000. The bounce is a 200. That's why we have 13, 2. And you can see that's significant. Well, see, that was a no-brainer. <clears throat> I did predict that one in advance because when we hit 14, I said we're probably, you know, we'll probably end up with a thousand point pullback. And if you're having a thousand point pullback, we know from a thousand point pullback that 13.4 is going to be the strong bounce line. And that should be where you bounce as you're pulling back. In other words, <clears throat> if if 13 is going to hold initially, doesn't doesn't to hold, I mean forever, but if 13 is going to hold initially. You expect a strong bounce line of 13, which is 13.4, to provide support. If it doesn't provide support, so in other words, if I say, okay, what would a 5% pullback be of 14,000? So 14,000, 0.05, so 700 points. Well, I could have done that in my head, right? All right, so 700 points. So you're going to fall to at least 13.3. You expect a 5% pullback. So 13.3 is your line here. And if it's 13.3, you would then calculate, um, <clears throat> you would then you would then calculate, um, oh, I'm sorry, it's not the really right way to look at it. Let's, let's take the run into account. Because your pullback is really 20% of the run. So how much is the run? We, we went up in the NASDAQ, and the question is, when's the last time we consolidated? The last time we consolidated was, 11,000, 12,000 in that range. All right, so low to high, you know, we would say this is definitely a consolidation area because it went on from September to November, or really from August to November, and then we broke up. So we had a good solid consolidation period here before we broke higher. Therefore, your run is technically, technically it's from 11, but really from 12, so 12 to 14, it's the same though, it's still 200 points, a 20% pullback of that run is 800 points. And we said seven if we did a 5% pullback. So that means we're in the right range there. If we calculate from 11, then it would be a 3,000 point run, 20% of 3,000. Hang on. Yeah, 20% uh, of 3,000 is, is 400 and a strong pullback would be 800. So all the numbers coalesce around seven, eight, six, seven, eight hundred is the amount of pullback we expect on this run. So that means 13, and if we take six, seven, eight, obviously we take seven. So 13, three ish is basically where we do expect to see a pullback for short. If 13, three fails, then we're gonna have a more than 20% pullback, a larger pullback, and we'd be looking down the next six, the next 700 below that, which will bring us down to, um, 11, I'm sorry, 12 to 12, 4, which is really here. Which, so it's interesting that the math works out, but 12, 4 would be the next line that we'd be looking for for some support. And it's funny how far back you can go, right? Look how 12, 4 goes back. And all we did was the math. See, that's, that's the thing. This, the chart doesn't matter. It's the math that matters. And, um, and it's like a Fibonacci retracement. It's the same concept, except it, this is a, the 5% rule is really a Fibonacci retracement for computers. So the more you have computer trading, which is now like 90% of the market, the more likely you are to follow the 5% rule in the market and sell us. <clears throat> so um, where was I? Oh, yeah. So anyway, so bottom line is this is the zone we're in, 14,000. We expect to get down to 12.4. 12, so now, so now I'm not going to look at anything else. We're going to say from 14,000 to 124, what do we expect? That is a 1600 point drop. We're going to call it 300 point uh a 300 point 20% bounce. So the bounces should be 300 point segments. So that's going to take you from 124 to 127 to 13. So 13 is the strong bounce line from 124. That's what that's what 13 is. You expect, as I said before, you expect the strong bounce line to show support. And and so bouncing off 13, even if we continue below 13, indicates we're going to have good support <coughs> at 12.4. And then we'll see if that holds up. And then we can go further back and, and look at the bigger picture to see if 
what happens if 12 four breaks. But that's what the 5% rule tells you. It doesn't tell you that we're definitely going to go there. It does tell you that if 13 breaks, which it's likely to as we're retesting it. So on the whole, when we stay below the strong bounce line, what we're doing is we're consolidating for move down. See, same here. Stay below the strong bounce line, which was here at the time. You're consolidating for move down. You're not consolidating for move up. If the strong bounce line acts as a pretty solid ceiling, you are almost certainly, you know, and, and especially when you start spending more time at the floor than you're spending at the, at the top of the channel, you're very likely to be consolidating for move down. Below 13, 3, 13, 3, back to 13. Once you fail 13, 12, 7, and then 12, 4. 12, 4 is the next major support. So that's what we're going to be looking for in the long run. And um, and again, so the five percent rule tells you where your support and resistance where your support and resistance points are going to be. Then you have to think about the macros, and that's where we go back to what I do on most Mondays, which is say, what is the week looking like? What's ahead? You know, I mean, we know the overall macros. <laughs> of what's going on. No, 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 here we go. So here's the calendar. And so looking ahead, remember we were talking about how um, Robert Kaplan speaks a lot this week. He spoke yesterday, spoke today. He's not speaking today. I mean, he spoke yesterday, spoke Monday. Not speaking today, but then, um, then he speaks tomorrow night and one, two, three times on, although that's kind of the same time. So twice on Friday, basically, morning and open and close on Friday, Robert Kaplan. So you go by that, you go by what's actually coming out, the minutes are coming out now. I can't see how the minutes are going to disappoint the market, though. It doesn't make much sense, does it? Um, you got the Philly Fed, you have leading economic indicators. That's not going to tell us anything about inflation, really. This might a little bit give us an indication. Um, we have PMI. That's really important, though. And then we have uh, existing home sales and new home, sale, uh, new home sales were crap last month. They were down 10%. So if existing home sales are also down, <laughs> that's going to freak people out on Friday. And, and don't forget, the Fed knows this. They know what things are going to be before. They, they, you know, they they have the information. So you know, it's like um, it's like Price Waterhouse knows who wins the Oscar, right? They put it in the freaking envelope. Of course, they know who won it. <laughs> the fact that you don't open the envelope until later doesn't mean they don't know who won. Um, so that's how you know. So the Fed, like, they make these reports. They they, they like sit there and and work on them and put them together. So of course, uh, they know what it's going to be before it happens. Um, we had the EIA today. We didn't pay any attention to that at all. Let's see what happened there. Obviously, it wasn't good, though, because the oil did not do well today. So let's see if we can find that. Page down. <laughs> there we go. So there's a slight build in oil. They didn't want to see that. There was a drawer in gasoline, a drawer in distillate. So on the whole, it's a small drawer. It's nothing terrible, nothing exciting. But <clears throat> it wasn't taken very well by the oil patch. Well, it was actually. Here's 1030. We, had, we actually had a nice recovery off 62. For whatever reason, they were really panicking into this report because we went from 60, we went from 67 yesterday to 62. Five dollar drop is, is crazy in a day for oil. So we'll see what happens next. But that's uh, an interesting thing how it got weak so easily. Speaking of weak so easily, though, what about Bitcoin? <laughs> how ridiculous! Um, it's like, wait, do they have this? Do they have a Bitcoin thing here? Bit. They don't actually track Bitcoin liquid index. Oh yeah, okay. <clears throat> so here you go. So Bitcoin, 
was this is May 12th. This is a month ago, $63,000. And today it came very close to 30 and it bounced back to 40. So unfortunately, all the gains for the year have been wiped out of Bitcoin at this point. And we're and we've re, we've lost half the gains. Well, from ten thousand to <clears throat> yeah, ten to sixty is is thirty. Oh uh, yeah, almost yeah. It's it's a good. I mean, actually, you know what that is? That's a strong retrace. That's what that is. You've lost forty percent of your gains. That's a strong. That is a strong retrace. So if we hold up here, it's actually not bad. If you hold forty, it's actually not bearish for Bitcoin. It means that you're finally consolidating just like with the market if we drop from where we are now if we drop 40 percent which would be obviously everybody would be freaking out but <clears throat> if we drop 40 percent and form a nice base and move forward we can probably guarantee that that's never going to happen again that we'll never see those numbers again you know like we did in 2008 we had this hard we had a 60 percent drop in 2008 <clears throat> and we recovered but it's not like we're ever going back to that that's not going to happen again we formed a proper base things have been valued properly and now we're moving forward the problem with all this free money bullshit is that you have no no ability to really value things properly i mean don't forget apple went back to like i mean it's hard to relate to now because you know in, in in the old shares apple would now be um two thousand dollars no wait what are they at not two thousand um One twenty-four. Sorry. So it's a uh, seven. They, they do seven for one split. So they would be um, seven one seventy-five, eight seventy-five. So they'd be almost at that. They'd be eight seventy-five per share of the old shares, and they were down to seventy-five, one tenth of where they are now <clears throat> when the market crashed. And Ford was four dollars, and Bank Citibank was two dollars, and blah blah blah. So. Things have when when things correct properly, and I wouldn't say uh, well over you could overcorrect properly. But the bottom line is we had a big correction in two thousand eight, <clears throat> and after which real buyers came in with real money and bought you know real buyers came in with real money that they earned, not that was given to them by the Fed. People who had money took their money and bought stocks. Those are real long-term investors. They set a value floor on a stock. So when you build a base like that, you do very well. When you build a small, shallow base, and we built the base for a long time, right? It took us, it took us many years to get back to the levels we were before we fell. So it took a very long time because it's not natural when, you know, like by the dip in, in 2007, 2008, we said it was a joke because everything, dips get bought, but you're like, this is ridiculous. You can't get a proper sell-off. And of course, if you don't get a proper sell-off, eventually you get a massive sell-off. You don't let off steam. It eventually explodes. And that's where we are now. We're doing the same thing, making the same mistakes, setting up the same kind of market catastrophe that we had back then. So we got to be very careful. And it's not, you know, this is a little sell-off, but we got rescued. You know, we're, on the whole, we're getting rescued very quickly here. And I, and I don't see it. I don't see that the environment's right for that. I think we're going to have, probably have a little bit of a reckoning. Um, Robin says, holding 3,000 shares of tea strictly for the dividend, with the dividend cut likely, uh, or is Barron's blowing smoke, she says, and potential downside pressure on the stock, would selling at least part of the position here and adding it to my BCE positions uh, with a 5.8% dividend be a wise move. <laughs> I mean, that's a big question. Um, we just, I, I don't know if you're a chat member, but we just talked about this in chat, actually. And I guess my answer would be basically the same because somebody asked this question earlier. <clears throat> Let's find where I said it. Well, okay, let's talk about AT&T. AT&T is taking a massive sell-off for not a particularly good reason. Um, Barron's is saying that they're going to cut their dividend. <coughs> they just spun off Time Warner, but spinning it off doesn't mean it went, they, they wrote it off. It just means it went down. So T took a massive hit from 33 to 29 $4 off. 
fantastic time to get in and buy it right now. Um, and I wrote, anytime they're below 30 is a good time to enter. Um, they gave up, 30, look, they gave up 30 to 31 percent, actually. They gave up 31 percent of the revenues of Time Warner. So in other words, the way they did this, this merger, they gave Discovery, um, they gave Discovery the at t the Time Warner HBO portion of the company. Discovery gave them $48 billion cash. Um, they, at t will now own 71% of the combined company. <sighs> So not only do they get their, not only do they have 70% of the revenues that they were getting anyway from Time Warner HBO, but now they're getting 70% of Discovery's revenues also. So if you go over to, to Discovery, uh, Yahoo, 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 here you go. So we go over to, uh, so we go to Discovery. And they're a $16 billion market cap currently, and they went down recently. This thing put them down a bit. Not too much, but, you know, they, they're down from 37 to 32. Um, but, oops, financially, they're doing $10 billion in revenues, and they're making a billion dollars. So, so AT&T gained a billion dollars in profit, 70%. So they gained 70% of a billion dollars in profit against whatever portion Time Warner is for AT&T. And we can find that out, hopefully, because probably AT&T has a profile. There's their profile. All right, there's Time Warner. There you go, very good. So 24% of AT&T's money comes from Time Warner. All right, so now we have some clues. 24% of their money comes from Time Warner. What's that last item? Can we see that? Xander, <laughs> you know what that is. All right, wow, look at that poor Latin America. I bet they're gonna put their money into Latin America. That's really sad how small it is. Of course, then you gotta take on Carlos Slim, so maybe not. Hmm. Interesting. All right, so anyway, so 24.7% is, is the time warner. So now we go back and now we do some more math. So we say, okay, so, oh, I'm sorry. So now we have to find out how much money at t makes. So at t la 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 la, oh there it is. So at t $170 billion in revenue, holy crap. <coughs> and they make, mm, well, you, you know, you don't go by this obviously. They make $20 billion a year, let's say, okay? So a quarter of that is $5 billion. So now we get Mr. Calculator and we say, okay, so AT&T gives, puts $5 billion of revenue in to the company. They add $1 billion and 0.7 and 71% of that is still theirs, 4.260. So in other words, AT&T is still a profit. Sorry, this profit, not revenue. So AT&T is still getting 4.26 billion in profit from Time Warner, even the you know from the from Time Warner Discover, even though they gave up their percentage of it. So it's it's almost a non-event. It almost is. It's almost for them not much of a change. Not only that though, but they were given 40 billion dollars. So for giving to give up not even a billion a year, they were given 40 billion dollars. How is this a negative for the company? They're still getting the same revenue stream coming in, whether it whether it gets spun off into separate stock or whatever, one way or another, they're still getting the revenue stream and they're still gonna make the money and they're still gonna have the income and they're still gonna have the uh, the uh, the reach and the benefits of being part of that organization. They're really not doing much giving up here and they're getting and they're pocketing $48 billion. There's no reason not to do it. If they didn't do it, I'd be pissed. Not that they're doing it. So it doesn't change their ability to make money. So there's, so I don't, I don't consider it a major change for the company. In the long-term portfolio, 
we born way back on 1016. What did, what did at t look like back then? All right, so so in October they were down around 28. They were lower than they are now when we came into AT&T. And that's perfectly normal because I don't like to buy a stock when it's not on sale. Oh, there's October. Why does it show up on this chart? That's weird. It doesn't show up on this one. Wouldn't you think it's the same chart? That's really weird. <clears throat> Anywho, um, so we came in in October 16th, which is right about here when I put my foot down and said, I'm, I'll take at t for 27 bucks. I don't give a shit. And again, you have to, if you're a value investor, you have to learn to totally ignore the chart. It's like, it's just what the idiots are doing. That's just, a, it, all it is, is a map of the idiots. It has nothing to do with reality. It's not, it, it'll show you sentiment and tell you what people are doing, but it doesn't have anything to do with the value of the company. So what I see is an opportunity. I say, oh my God, what I'm worried about is it might not go lower. That's what I was worried about. I'm like, this is ridiculously cheap. It may not go lower. So we jumped in and I think we jumped in right before earnings because we were worried that earnings would be good and earnings were good and then people sold it again and it went finally back up. Um, but anyway, so, um, we, so that's when we came in. This was an adjustment. We we did something or other and moved something or did something. I forget what I forget what it was, but whatever we did, and we ended up and we ended up. Oh no, I'm sorry. I I apologize. That's not what happened. In in September, I'm wrong. In September we came in. That's what it was. September third, way up here. So when it fell below thirty, we came in. I see what happened now. It fell below thirty. We sold these puts and calls. And apparently what happened is when it did dip on us, instead of getting, instead of panicking in, I imagine we must have started with 50 and we rolled and we added, went up to 100. So we increased our position at the low. And that's why we have this nice profit here because we came in and redid those on the low. Um, anyway, and then we and then we left uh, not a full cover because we were waiting for a better bounce. I should have, we should have sold some here. We were greedy and we did, should have actually sold more covers there. Um, anyway, not, not the point of your question though. Your question was more like this. Here's a nice summary we had though in chat about all the, the goings on at at and Um, and Jetta, we talking about the dividends, the percentage. See now, I'm, and I was talking about like, look, here's your, these are your subscribers. This is, uh, wireless subscribers for at and t not losing market share. And here's your broadband. Not not exciting, but it's you know chugging along the broadband. But the problem is, even even with all the work they put in, that's where they are on HBO now. They're 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 lower. They're below CBS, which is Viacom, which I like Viacom because I knew this was you know I, I appreciated what they were doing here. Um, Apple TV did not catch on, and for good reason too. I watch it now and. Uh, um, it, it's really, uh, it's, I, I prefer Hulu. <laughs> My favorite is Hulu. I like, I like Hulu for, I like the way they track shows. Although Netflix is really, you know, also top notch. I mean, as far as like usability and all that. Amazon Prime's not bad either. So I get, I, I mean, to me, it's the, the three best interfaces are in front. So that makes sense to me. Um, but the bottom line is, look at look look at the road they've got to climb. So they they merging with Discovery, who's down here somewhere below this. Uh, that'll put them sort of on par with CBS, and they've got to build their base from there to try to catch up. But but you know, this is a big market share. So sixty percent of the people have have Netflix. Fifty forty five percent of the people have the Amazon. It's going to add up to more than one hundred percent because people have more than one thing. 30 something percent have Hulu, 30 percent have Disney. You know, we have, well, let's see, I've got Netflix, I've got Amazon, I've got Hulu, I've got Disney. Um, I don't have an Apple TV, but I have, I don't know, I watch some kind of Apple on my smart TV. I don't know what the hell it is. Uh, we also have CBS All Access. Uh, we have HBO now, but that comes with Hulu, I think. And not Showtime. <laughs> <laughs> As indicated by the uh, popularity, we don't have Showtime. Um, anyway, 
So who was talking to me about this thing? So then I was, uh, da, da, da. oh, we had a whole big discussion about this. I can't find it. Stuart, okay, there you go, Stuart. Now I know where to look. So Stuart had a similar question to yours. Sorry, getting back, getting back to uh, Robin eventually. So Stuart asked this question in chat. Uh, he says, I excised WBA, no, WBA? Oh, damn it, I thought that was at and <laughs> Oh, are you kidding me? It wasn't even an at t discussion? Uh, <laughs> all right, in that case, let's talk about yours then. I am sorry. I, I could have sworn we were talking about at t when we had that conversation. <clears throat> so you have 3,000 shares of at t in an IRA. They're going to cut the dividend. You have it for the dividend. Uh, 3,000 shares at times 30 is, what, 90,000 bucks, right? Give ninety thousand dollars worth of AT and T. It's in your IRA account. What are you allowed to do in an IRA? Hmm. AT and T in an IRA. I'll tell you, here's an interesting thing. <laughs> if you're just in it for the dividend, the dividend is what? It's, um, is it a dollar? <laughs> Where the hell is it? <laughs> For that, there it is. All right, so the dividend of AT and T is two dollars. Wow, that's crazy. <laughs> Too much. All right, so the question is, can can you get that any other way? Nah, I mean, look, it's a cheap enough stock where I don't mind owning it. But if you bought it. And you sold the well. I mean, don't see this terrible prices. These these option prices suck. If you convert the stock, though, you take if you take your your ninety thousand dollars off the table, and ninety thousand dollars of stock or thirty thousand shares, um, I'm sorry, three thousand shares, right? Three thousand shares. So three thousand shares times two is six thousand. Obviously, six thousand dollars. So can you make $6,000 with at t in another way? Well, um, if we look at the um, the short June trade, you can sell the $30 puts for $0.38. Cents. If we go to September, we can sell $30 calls for, 90, for, for $0.88. Cents. So if I want to make... And, and that's only 121 days, not a year. So if I want to make $3,000, I can sell, um, let's say, let's let's say, let's say 40 of these. Let's say so I've got 40 of the September 30 calls for 90 cents. And that's going to give me uh, 90 times 40 is 3,600 bucks, okay, in 121 days. Now, what do I have to cover that with? I got to cover that with 40 because you're in an IRA, right? So you have to be fully covered. So I'm going to cover that with 40 of the uh, 2023 30 calls. And that's two bucks. So that's going to cost me um, $6,000 for 3,000 of them, right? So it's only going to cost me $6,000 to buy 30 of these calls. Taking 90,000 off the table. I buy 30 of these calls and I sell 30 of the same strike calls except in September. 
that means I've got <clears throat> I've got um, October, November, December, January. So four. I have um, sixteen more months to sell, and I'm using. Um, what we say we're selling September, so we're selling um, June, uh, June, July, August, September. So we're selling four or five months, and we've got sixteen months left to sell. So instead of owning the stock at all, if you buy these calls for two dollars, and you sell these calls September twenty one for ninety cents. You're only, for, first of all, you're only paying net whatever, but the point being that you are collecting much more, you're collecting more money than you would get in dividend, tying up not even a tenth of what you would have had, more, more like one twentieth of the money that you have committed in the stock, and you're getting the same thing. Now, what do you do? If it's just shooting up on you, well, all that's gonna happen is you get called away here. You can just buy more of the next strike higher and have, uh, and layer your, um, and layer your thing. You can roll it, if you look at January, for example, the January 30, well, 30, January jumps to 33, but the 33 calls are 58. So let's say AT&T does go up 10% on you. You've got these short 90 calls, what would happen? These short 90 calls would go up, um, would go up to $3 in strike, which is hard to say what it would be, but let's say it would be the same as the, I mean, let, let's say it would be close to uh, three bucks, okay? So you'd be down $2 there. But what would you do? You're gonna roll them along to the next, to a higher strike, like the 33s. And the 33s will have gone up to the 30 price, which is $1.30. All right, and then and then you could possibly roll to two times those. And what would you do here? You would make the, but you would add your own 33. So you'd spend another $6,000. I'm sorry, not 6,000, 9,000. Why not? Yeah, <laughs> here it's 6,000. So you'd spend another $6,000 on whatever stock, on whatever is $2, like 35, and you will have, and then you'll be covered. So it's like playing leapfrog. Like you go back here and back here and build a bigger position, a bigger position. As I was saying this morning, that's what we did with Apple in the butterfly portfolio. We, ended up, we, we kept backing up and building a bigger position. But in the end, you don't mind building the bigger position because, um, where is it? La-di-da, portfolios. Hello? Butterfly. Ooh, look at that, took a hit today. Um, so we don't mind taking a bigger position. We have 160 bull call spreads now. Why? Because the same thing, whenever we got burned on our short calls, we would roll it and add more of the longs. And as you can see, these short calls are in the money. And we have three, four times the coverage that we need to cover them. So we're not in any danger. And we end up with a, um, what is this? 30 times 160. It's a $480,000 spread. If we hit this, and, all, and right now it doesn't look that great, but it's a $480,000 spread. We're, we're only at, we, well, we paid um, not even $100,000 for it. And that's not even counting the, the short puts and calls we sold that, that contributed. So we have a $480,000 spread that's a bonus to the selling of these calls. That's what I'm talking about setting up at and You can do the same kind of thing. And you see the power of that because you currently have $90,000 tied up in stock. <clears throat> and for $6,000, you can flip to a bull call spread that's going to pay you basically the same dividend. If your long calls happen to improve in value, that's just a bonus, but you will collect that dividend. The short calls are your dividend. You won't collect an actual dividend. You will collect the short call money every time you sell it. And that's how you pay yourself a dividend using the option. So you can do that, take most of the money off the table. Uh, you'll cry a lot less if the market collapses and then you can go in and buy the stock back again. <clears throat> And if you feel more bullish about it, just buy more shares. They're only two bucks. The $30 calls are only $2, 18 months. 
Now, the reason that these are so cheap, the reason it's only $2 for the $30 calls when at and is at 29, it was at 30 this morning, right? It was at 29. So it's just a little bit out of the money, but the reason these are so cheap is because at and has such a high dividend because they give away all their profits. They give it back to the shareholders. It does not contribute to the growth of the company. It does not drop to the bottom line of the company. Therefore, the company itself doesn't gain value. But why isn't the company gaining value? Because it's paying out the dividend. Can't do both. If you're paying out big fat dividends, you're not going to be able to grow your company and you're going to get stagnant. <clears throat> I mean, obviously they're growing a little bit, but not enough to make anybody excited. Will they cut the dividend? I don't know, but if they don't cut the dividend, the stock will go flying up. But maybe you want to buy, um, we, what do we say? We're going to sell 40, right? So maybe you want to buy 60 of these for $12,000, still, you don't forget you took 90 off the table. You buy 60 of these for $12,000, and you sell 40 of these, the, the uh, 30s, for um, $4,000. So what are you doing? You're spending net $8,000 for 60 of the AT&T longs. And the assumption is if these go worthless, you're gonna sell another 90, which will, and now if you sell another 90 for another 4,000, you cut your net entry cost from eight to four. And if you sell another 4,000 and that expires, you cut your cost to, to zero. And then you've got a free ride here. Then whatever these are worth is profit. You know, now if a stock pays, as a rule of thumb for me, if a stock pays more than a 5% dividend, I'm inclined to own it. I'm, I, you know, then I don't mind collecting my dividend because I'm happy with that bonus 5% a year, and we can set up a nice simple spread and make 10, 15% on the spread. Anything that pays you 20% a year in a conservative fashion is a great trade. So once you hit that 5% threshold on dividend, I'm kind of into having the stock. But again, we don't know if at and is gonna cut, you don't know if it's gonna go back to $25. So if you don't wanna take that hit, just take the money off the table for now. And you can still stay in the play by doing a simple option spread. Nothing fancy, nothing that violates an IRA or anything like that. Just a very simple option spread that works on this kind of stock. Wayne says, what do you think the chance of going to a period of runaway inflation like the 80s? Are conditions uh, similar between then and now, given the massive debt and the Fed's unwillingness to acknowledge and act on the inflationary trends? The Fed says inflation is transitory, do you believe them? No, that's what I've been writing about all week. Um, I don't believe them. I don't. It, it, okay. Oh, there's an article in Journal today. You know what happened? I went to I went to get it and I lied. It disappeared. Um, wow. And I can't I can't remember who it was. Damn it! Somebody like. Hmm. It was a big employer, but I don't remember who it was. Anyway, somebody uh, is raising wages from $20. Their minimum wage for the company is $20. They're raising it to $25 an hour, minimum wage for the company. Not Costco, um, but, but somebody who's a huge employer in, in America, and I can't remember who it was. But once you do that, once you see rate wages rising like they're rising now, and we're talking, you're talking 10% increases in wages now for a lot of people. These rate, wages are going up quite a bit. Um, you can't put the genie back in the bottle unless you're going to give people pay cuts, right? And, and how many times in your life have you taken a pay cut? Um, unless you're going to give, unless you're going to take it all back and give people pay cuts and tell them to downsize their lives for you. Uh, you are pretty much going to be stuck with higher wages. And that means that the company then has to find a way to cover it. Eventually prices go up and that's embedded inflation. That's when you keep, that's, that's inflation that's never going away. It's a new price. And, and I mean, to sit there and see, there was another one, there, there, there was a video on the Wall Street Journal today of Janet Yellen lying, lying her ass off. Um, uh, again, about inflation and not a problem, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, give me a freaking break. How do you sit there in the middle of this, 
looking at the price of things going up and up and up and say this is not a problem. Of course it's a problem. Now, inflation isn't inherently evil. If you're getting wage inflation with price inflation, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just part of growth. Uh, but it, it causes disruptions because it's not an even, uh, a well-matched thing. So sometimes wages lag way behind, sometimes wages get ahead. Uh, so sometimes the employees are doing better, sometimes the companies are doing better. Uh, it's not like you can say one way it's good or one way it's bad. You know, but on the whole, the most the most important thing inflation does though is it wipes out your debt. It, it it devalues your debt. And if something devalues your debt, your debt becomes easier to pay because your GDP is inflating, hopefully faster than you're spending money, although that's a neat trick in this account in this country. Um, but in theory, if you can get your GDP to inflate faster than you can then you can put yourself further into debt, then you could get actually improve your economic position. Um what I was talking about the other day in uh, in the in the morning report that we do, um, Japan uh, has um, three hundred percent debt to GDP, the third largest economy in the world. So to some extent you say, oh, well, then we could get, then we could go to 300% debt to GDP, I guess, because Japan hasn't exploded yet. Uh, <laughs> although literally they had a reactor that exploded, but um, <laughs> it's, um, the, the country as a whole is still there. Um, but the problem is that they're third the way like, um, like like RC Cola is third, you know, it's like they're not, they're not third like neck and neck with Coke and Pepsi. They're third like way back there. You know, China, 10 billion ish economy, 15 billion economy, maybe some might say. Um, America, 20 billion, tri trillion, sorry, trillion, 20 trillion dollar economy. That doesn't really compare to Japan. And the problem, the thing is, so, okay, fine. So Japan can borrow $10 trillion, although not really if you think about it, like who the hell has $10 trillion to give them? Nobody really has that kind of money, but they borrowed it, so it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> so, they, so they borrowed, uh, or $15 trillion, they borrowed, I think the number is actually 13 at the moment. So they borrowed $13 trillion against a $5 trillion economy. Can the US then obvi obviously bar borrow uh, four, $45, $50 trillion because we have a $20 trillion economy? No, because who would give it to us? We have money. You're, and, oh, by the way, in Europe, you should really count Europe because Europe is a also $20 trillion economy. It's a bit bigger than ours, actually. Um, so Europe's a $20 trillion economy, too. So just because they're not one block on a map doesn't mean that you shouldn't really count Europe as a zone. So economic zone-wise, you've got uh, U.S., Europe, China, uh, alternate, the, the rest of Asia would be like a block also. Um, and then you've got Japan kind of stands by itself as a, as a real industrial giant of the region. Um, and I don't know what you would count Australia as. They're just sort of like laying there <laughs> doing whatever. Um, so... The thing is, though, that, that the, the so between U.S. $20 trillion economy, uh, Europe $20 trillion economy, Japan, China uh, $10 trillion economy, that's $50 trillion. So if Japan needs $10 trillion, it is conceivable. And by the way, that's our GDP. That's not our net worth. Net worth is more like, uh, actually, you know what? It's not really far off, interestingly enough, because um. I think the total asset, the total global assets is something like $100 trillion or something. Oh, they were at some point. They are $100 trillion until recently. God knows, they probably double that now. Um, but again, that's only on paper that can disappear quickly, as we learned in 2008. So global, let's, let's say global assets are a couple of hundred trillion dollars. So can Japan dip into that and find $10 trillion to, for someone to lend them or $15 trillion? Yeah, yeah, conceivably, sure. 
But the problem is, can we replicate that in the US? Can we do the same thing? No, we can't borrow $50 trillion, no matter what made up number you wanna put on the global total asset value. Uh, you know, it's just in any situation, who's gonna lend you? If there's 10 people in a room, are, are 25 of those people gonna lend all their money to one guy? That's just not realistic. So, on the bright side, you point to Japan and say, well, the U.S. isn't going to, the U.S. isn't obviously going to collapse with 100 and, uh, 120, 140% of our, our GDP in debt because Japan's got double that much of their GDP in debt and they're still functioning. So you can function and have that much debt. Does not necessarily mean your economy is going to collapse. On the other hand, though, when Greece got to 140% in debt, everybody decided they couldn't function and they collapsed because everyone decided they couldn't function. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Once you say, if somebody's not credit worthy and nobody gives them credit, then they're no longer credit worthy, right? Just because you say someone's not credit worthy, if you stop giving them money, if you have the power, if you have the power to, and this is what happened to Greeks, you, if you have the power to declare somebody not to be credit worthy and you stop lending them money and other people follow you and don't lend them money, suddenly they have no money and their credit's no good. And that puts them into an incredible crisis. That would be hard to do to America, also but also mainly because we can print our own money. Greece cannot print their own money. They don't have a central bank. The ECB doesn't work for Greece. So, but that means all of Europe has issues like Greece has issues if they get too much in debt because the ECB doesn't necessarily have the ability to step in and save all these countries. Um, which is why they tend not to get classified. That's why when you hear the largest economies, it's the economies that have accept, you know, their own banking systems, not just any old com company, uh, countries. Um, so China's got the PBOC, we have the Fed, Japan's got the Bank of Japan, even England has the Bank of England, they've got their own bank. <clears throat> but we, uh, we aren't gonna get into the position Greece got into because we can always print our own money. We can get in the position that Germany got into after World War I, uh, because they printed their own money and it didn't go very well. Zimbabwe printed their own money a while ago, didn't go very well. You know, when you print your own money, you devalue your currency. And, we, and we've seen that. That's horrific what's going on. Um, no, not tax, currencies. Dollar, long time. So, you know, here we were in 2001. This was the end of the dot-com era and the end of Clinton and all that, right? Um, so we had 9-11 and whatever. This is when the Fed started bailing things out, 9-11, uh, September 11, 2001, right? So June, July, August, September, okay. So 9-11 right about here. We went down, went back up a little, then crashed, just desperately problem. But what were we doing? Printing money, printing money, going to war, printing money, printing money, going to war, blah, blah, blah. So a downward spiral, all the way down to 75. We went from 120 to 75, the buying power of dollar. Now, <clears throat> interestingly enough, what happened during that time? Well, the value of your home skyrocketed, right? And the market also skyrocketed because the dollars you were buying your homes and, and stocks with became very wor very worth a lot less. Gold skyrocketed at the time also. Um, so there was a lot of, um, so a lot of things are offset, but the bottom line is we didn't feel poor because those of, especially those of us who were investors did not feel poor because everything was going so well. And there were plenty of jobs. It was, a good, it was a good expansion on the whole. It really was. But the problem is it was a good expansion that was being based on a fallacy. And that fallacy was that mortgage-backed securities could be freely traded as if they were themselves a derivative. And so, and, and in fact, mortgage-backed securities were being traded like Bitcoins, basically, like cryptocurrency. People just basically made them up and floated them, and other people ran out and bought them as if they were as if they were as good as gold. And um, that turned out not to be true. Those the other assets collapsed, meaning the dollar got stronger, but not because of any kind of policies to make the dollar stronger, only because the other assets relatively collapsed. 
still drifting along, still weak dollar, still weak dollar. Got a bit stronger the last few years <clears throat> and is now coming back down. Significantly down, though, down 10% since COVID started. And 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 since Trump, you know, well, basically, basically, it's not so much different than Trump because Trump came in, what, January 2017? So Trump came in, we had a pretty darn strong dollar all during um, Obama's time in office from here to here. We basically were strengthening the dollar, reducing debt, so on and so forth. Trump goes back to uh, increasing debt and all kinds of nonsense and foreign policy and whatever. So the dollar started getting weaker. We bottomed out in 2018, came back a bit though, just because other countries were much more screwed up than we were. That was the, relative to other countries, we weren't that bad. Um, and, but then, then, then starting in 2020, the Fed just went crazy and we've been printing money like crazy. We're gonna break this and go down further. This is, this is consolidating for a move lower at the moment. And, and inflation is not going to help. I mean, inflation is generally a devaluing of your dollar. The only, the only thing holding this up right now, other countries are just as bad as us. They're not better. They look better, but they're not better. They're not Japan. How could you possibly think Japan is better? Look at them. Since 2012, they've dropped their currency 40%. Here's England. Okay, this was the Brexit non. Well, no, this wasn't Brexit. I'm sorry. Here's they, they went through the crisis. Then they have the Brexit nonsense. So they're they're still way down here. Uh, Canada is a resource rich country. They should actually do inflation. Uh, Switzerland, they, they, this is completely artificial. They keep their money as flat as they possibly can. Australia also resource rich. They should do well. And why is New Zealand even on this list? In New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> and New Zealand. How's oil doing? Ooh, look at that. Wow. What a recovery. Oh, I'm sorry. That's that's uh, monthlies. <laughs> I was like, get out of here. <laughs> okay, that makes more sense. It's still weak. Anyway, what was the question? I don't remember anymore. Oh, were the conditions similar to the 80s? <laughs> so... <clears throat> You know, you, you've, got, you've got a Fed that really can't raise rates. That's the problem, okay? So, in other words, they can't stop buying bonds because if they stop buying bonds, who's going to buy our bonds? Who is going to buy our 1.68% 10-year bonds when inflation is 4 and 5%? When real inflation is 4 not, not not the bullshit the Fed comes up with, but real inflation 4 or 5%. Who is going to buy a bond that's losing 3% a year? Okay, only the Fed is stupid enough to do that. That's why they are the majority buyer of all bonds now. That's why these auctions are going so poorly. We don't have any outside interest in these bonds. <clears throat> so the Fed's in a really tough spot. They have to keep buying the bonds. They have to keep pumping money into the system. They, that increases the money supply. So what the Fed does is they create money out of nothing. They write a check. It would be great if you could do this yourself, right? They write a check for the amount of the treasury bills, right? For the, whatever they're buying at auction, they write a big check for $100 billion. That creates $100 billion. They don't have it. It's not like cash sitting in their bank somewhere. They just write a check, and what they do is they put on their books as an asset $100 billion of treasury bills, which is as good as cash. And therefore, they say, see, we have the cash to back up that check. It's these treasury bills we bought. And then you say, but you bought the treasury bills with the cash that you're claiming you have because you bought the treasury bills. <laughs> and it goes, it goes around a lot. It's a very, you know, get caught in a logic loop, basically. It doesn't make any sense. It doesn't, it's, it's bullshit bookkeeping. And obviously anybody else who did that would be arrested. But the Fed, that's how they operate. That's how they create money, put it into the system, and exchange it for what? For a piece of paper that the government created. The government creates a, a note saying, we will pay you back this money that we don't have. And the Fed says, fantastic, we will buy that note that you that says you will pay us back with money you don't have. And we will treat it as if it is AAA rated cash on our books, as good as gold. And here is the cat, here is the money from here is the money from, from us written, written, written actually on treasury paper back to the treasury. 
<clears throat> and they get to call that cash and use it as working capital. It's total nonsense. Our entire financial system is based on a complete fabrication. Um, so they can't stop doing that. Though. They, they're, they're trapped because if they stop doing it, then no one will buy the bonds. If no one buys the bonds, then we're Greece. Then everybody's then our credit's no good. Nobody wants our bonds. People start dumping it. It's a disaster. They can't, they can't stop. They're trapped in this thing. So inflation will keep going until it is so bad that we have to take drastic measures to stop it. Nobody's going to want to take early measures to stop it. And that's why they're currently trying to talk it down with this transitory bullshit. And by the way, inflation is very much based on uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy where your expectations of inflation cause the inflation. That's why the last uh, survey they did where they asked people what your outlook is on inflation, they were very worried because the people that they polled in the surveys all said, we think inflation is high and getting higher. And when people expect there to be inflation, it changes their behavior um, and uh, causes them to um, to save less, spend more. They'll spend more now, they'll save less uh, because things get more expensive, right? So if you want something, buy it now because it's only going to be more money later. And uh, then, then companies start having to ratchet up their labor. And once you start doing the labor, it starts locking it in and you're screwed. And that's where we are now. So we're at the really early stages of that. I mean, you don't, I, I don't know how well you guys remember this stuff, but I mean, you know, when I was a kid, uh, you would quit a job. If you didn't get a 10% raise, first of all, if, if you didn't get a bonus, a Christmas bonus of 5%, 10%, like almost a month's salary, two weeks at least, two weeks at least bonus for Christmas, maybe a month. That was how you went Christmas shopping. If you didn't get that, you you were looking for another job in January. Because you can't, people didn't have budgets for these things. It's like you, you really needed that money. Um, and not just because we were kids. I think pretty pretty sure everybody had the same problem. Um, that Christmas bonus was everything back then. Um but it wasn't just that though. Also, every year on the anniversary of your working year, you would get a five to 10% raise. And if it wasn't 10%, again, you would start looking for another job. You could not afford to stay in a job that only gave you a 5% raise. You fell behind, you knew you were falling behind. You could feel it immediately. Your rent goes up 10%. You, you know, the food goes up 10%, movies went up 10%, everything is up 10%. You cannot not get a raise your job is devalued right if you don't get a raise and everything is getting more expensive and you're doing the same job then your labor has been devalued then you take your labor elsewhere where it is valued correctly that's just common sense economics but once you get locked into that cycle it's really hard to break <laughs> um now the Chinese regulators are putting squeeze on Bitcoin without the government's possibly falling, how can it move up? I don't think it can. I, 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 I've been saying forever that I said they're gonna, I said Bitcoin does, the difference between Bitcoin and fiat currencies like a dollar or a pound or a yen or whatever is the dollar is backed up by the, by the military. If you don't like it, they will shoot you. It's not, you know, if you counterfeit dollars, the police will come and arrest you. It's a secure currency that's being monitored six ways from Sunday and to keep it uh, clean and pure as, or as much or, or as much as they say, other than, of course, the Fed printing, whatever they want. But I said that from day one about Bitcoin, and I, I, I obviously was very surprised that it ever got to 60,000. But... That was my point. As soon as it becomes a legitimate threat to fiat currencies, the guys with the guns, the guys with the badges, the guys with the armies, as soon as you actually pose a threat to their currency, then they are going to start using the guns and the tanks and the badges and the courts. And they will throw and they will put you out of existence. <clears throat> and what are you going to do about it? Is the Bitcoin governing council all upset? There is no Bitcoin governing council. 
that the joy you have of a decentralized currency that isn't particularly run by anybody or supported by anybody means who the hell is going to come to your defense? Who's enforcing Bitcoin? Who is keeping it pure? Who is fighting for regulations to, to keep it alive? So it'll be legislated out of existence, basically, if, if it's a serious threat to the government. And, and, it's, and it was starting to become that. And China doesn't put up with things the way America does. America, Americans worry, Amer American politicians worry about pissing off their constituents and be like, oh, well, Elon Musk likes it and blah, blah, blah. And this guy likes it. And the Winklevoss twins are contributors, so I'm not going to go against it. You know, everybody's got that kind of crap in the, in the U.S. And China, they're like, ah, we all, they're like, no, 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 we control the, we control the yuan. That's what we like to control. And China came up with their own cryptocurrency. So obviously they were going to, uh, legislate Bitcoin out. It's a competitor. They don't want a competitor having free access to their market. They never do. That's the same as anything that they do, they do in China. Well, the Fed minutes came out. I wonder if they were interesting. How's the market doing? Of course, they weren't interesting, so that's not the point. No, oh, 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 did not come out well. Look at that, those Fed minutes are a disappointment, apparently. You know, I don't really care because it's like, it's, it's so stupid. It's like they don't really say anything. All right, well, there you go. I mean, it, it's what we expected, right? We didn't expect, we, again, what did we hit? 13 to weak bounce on the nose. 13 to and stop. You, you want to attribute this to the Fed minutes? Sure, attribute it to the Fed minutes. It's 13 to, it's a weak bounce line. That's where we came to. Uh, Robin says, I have AT&T at 31 at 29. How how would you average down? I would wait. Jeez, it's a teeny little variation. It can go right back up. What did, How is it affecting your life that it went to 29? You, you, don't, you, don't, you don't average out a dollar when a dollar is 3%. You know, if something moves down 20% on you and you intend to keep it, that's where you seriously have to consider averaging out so you're down 10 percent because 10 percent is recoverable 20 percent is really hard um you know e even then though i mean with options we we generally don't even double down until we're down about 40 percent it's at 20 percent if we decide to stick with the option that means that we're going to stick with the option as is and it's either going to go back to where it was or if it goes down another 20 percent then we're going to double down but even 20 percent isn't worth doubling down on an option on a stock yeah, I, I think on a stock, I would probably use that as a line. But but that's the same thing, though. If you're down, to, which you pretty much are right now, <clears throat> you have to decide whether you intend to eventually. Now, so what you'd say is if it goes down to 27, I will double down. Then I will average 29 and I'll be pretty happy, right? Because right now you're thinking of buying. You'd obviously be thrilled to buy it for an average of 29, but that's going to happen at 27. But what's really going to happen is it goes down to 27 and you freak out and think something must be really wrong with it and you don't buy it. But that's the time you should be doubling down is when it's at 27, not when it's at 29. 29 is a minor variation of where it was the last few weeks. It's right, it's in, it's right in the ball house, in the in the ball house, in the what the hell? Ballpark, ballpark, ball house. I'm like, I'm like, what on earth word was I trying to say? So, so in the ballpark, look here, here's AT and T. Here it is for the last uh, whatever month, six months. AT and T, thirty dollars. It's below it. It's above it. It's below it. It's above it. It's below it. Now it's below it. Before it was above it. So then it'll be above it again. This is the normal price. This is a normal swing. There's nothing to, to, to react to here. AT, I, I pointed this out before. AT&T was a, when I did my video, this has got to go back like 10 years. The one that says, be, be the house, not the gambler. When we made that video 10 years ago, that's crazy it was that long. Um, the example in the video is AT&T and buying AT&T at 30 and how to make money buying it even though we don't expect it to go anywhere. And here we are 10 years later, it's still at 30. And it'll always be at 30 because they give away all their profits. They pay it out as dividends. 
So they generate roughly the same amount of money all the time. They're worth about the same all the time. They don't really expand the company. But you can't expand the company if you're not if you're not going to leave America. You're not going to expand the company. And as we saw, Latin America is zero point eight percent zero. Yeah, 0.8% of the total revenues from Latin America. They have zero presence in Latin America. They have no presence in Canada. They have 180 million American subscribers. That's most of them. 180 million subscribers. You know, babies don't subscribe. So that's a lot of people. They have 180 million people using their system. <laughs> and so, so basically, more than half our population already uses AT&T. It's very hard for them to gain market share. They're kind of like Coca-Cola, except Coca-Cola is like worldwide with that problem. AT&T, you know, to, to, to go to another country is very difficult for them. So they kind of have to, that, so that's why they went into the media thing. They're like, we got to do something to grow this company. Let's uh, get more into media services. It's a logical extension of what we have. Ooh, that blew up in their face, didn't it? They, they did that disastrous purchase of DISH, and then to try to paper over the disastrous purchase of DISH, they did a uh, disastrous purchase of, uh, of uh, Time Warner, of AOL. They bought AOL. In the 20th century, they bought AOL. That makes no sense. It wasn't in the way, I mean, it still is an AOL. My mom still has AOL. <laughs> My mom still has AOL email. Um, and she still pays them nineteen dollars a month. It's so funny. Um, so she's the only person I know are there. Well, um, so anyway, so so they still get money from my mom, and that's why, and that's why they spent like fifty billion dollars on Dish. Um, so that that was you know that was obviously Dish Direct TV. All that was a disaster. They they did a botched job of it. Um, the AT&T um, service is a disaster. Everything they did in that was terrible. And so that, that was a lot of money down the tubes. But the point is, what are they going to do? They, got a, they, 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 they figured with some logic that they, they're like, well, we have 180 million subscribers, and you got to figure some of them want to watch, you know, um, um, cable and stuff like that on their phone or, you know, watch satellite TV on their phone or something. But the way they did it, the execution of it was so awful, and they didn't have enough content. And then they thought that buying Time Warner was going to improve their content offering, and they, you know because they had HBO and everything like that. But then they charged too much for it, and they didn't give it. To, they didn't make it accessible enough, and all made a lot of mistakes. Uh, what was the question? I don't remember what the question was anymore. Was it about Bitcoin? No, it was about averaging down AT and T. So anyway, so they're so they're thirty dollars stock. They don't really have a lot of room to expand. They have to really rethink where they are as a company and what they can do with themselves and so on and so forth. Um, but the execution of what they what they tried to do to expand over the last five, 10 years has been a complete and utter disaster. And, and now you say, and now you gotta say to yourself, okay, so now the new guy comes in and you're running at and and you're like, okay, we have 180 million subscribers. That's our biggest asset. What do we do with them? How do we get more money out of them? They didn't go. For, they didn't go for the. They didn't go for the HBO Max. That didn't work. Now what? 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 What do? What do these people want? What can we charge them? What can we get another ten bucks a month from them for them? That's what it's all about. You get ten bucks a month from 180 million people. That's 180. That's 18 uh, billion. 1.8 billion dollars a month. That's twenty billion dollars a year. That doubles AT and T's total total income. If they can figure out how to get ten dollars a month from their subscriber base, what do they do? What can they come up with that's going to be worth it? That's their leverage. If their subscribers are worth anything, that's their leverage point. What do they do? You know, I, I think they should be Groupon, frankly. I think that would be the smarter way to go. They, you know, you're AT&T. Make deals with everybody. And don't and don't try to charge people. You know, do what Groupon does, basically. In other words, make, make deals with the vendors and allow your customers to get discounts. And then you take a piece of what they spend in places. So instead of 
them having to give you more money, which people already resent how much money they give AT&T. How about try to save them money and be their hero and, and work it out like that? That's what I would do. I, I would I would be Groupon. I would put on, I would buy open table. I would do things like that. I would become a service. In any way I could become a service. I would even, I would even consider picking up ride sharing or something like that. I would want to do anything that people use their phone for. I'd be really interested in integrating into my company. So that when you're an AT&T subscriber, there's this umbrella of services that you have top level access to. And I know, I know with American Express, I get Uber. Um, I forgot what it's even called now. I, mean, I have not been in an Uber since before the pandemic. <clears throat> I think the last time, right before the pandemic we shut down, I, I, I think I took an Uber that the last time was that we went to the airport for something. Um, so, you know, if I'm at and I, I want to become a, a you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a phone company, be a phone company. Service people with your phones. Make sure you make sure people feel like owning an AT&T phone means something. Like I said with American, like I said with American Express, whatever it's called on Uber Platinum or something like that. I'm a, I'm a top level Uber person, even though I don't really use Uber all that much. Um, I still get this uh, reward thing because of, because of my American Express card. Um, things like that. That's that's what you should do. Look at what. Um, Visa and MasterCard do, right? They have their um, their their special concerts and things like that. That's what AT and T should be getting into. You know, give people experiences, get them movie tickets, get them theater tickets. Buy do a Fandango, buy a Fandango. You know, don't yet again, don't try to compete with some crappy ass service. Buy the best one out there. You got all the money in the world. Use it. Build a network of things that people use every day, like movie tickets restaurant reservations car car hiring um things like that that your phone becomes like a lifeline center for what you're doing and, and, and you know these apple should do this kind of shit too but they don't um but at&t you got a subscriber base that's really really powerful apple has that too but i'm saying if you have the subscriber base use it that's what they should be doing instead of trying to squeeze more money out of the subscribers Provide something to your subscribers that'll get you more money. That'll build some additional revenue. But that's just my crazy idea. Anyway, so bottom line is still wait and see where it really bottoms out. And if it doesn't bottom out and it flies back up, then fine. You were happy with your stock before. You'll be happy with it later. Bank of America. Oh, thank you, Alistair. I appreciate that. It was Bank of America, very large employer. Obviously, <laughs> they're raising their rates, their wages from twenty twenty dollar minimum wage to twenty five. So suddenly being a bank teller doesn't suck as a job. It's now a $50,000 job, right? 25 times 40 is a thousand. Yeah. So basically a thousand dollars a week job being a bank teller. That's not bad. That's realistic. Uh, okay. Oh, a bunch of people said, oh, the Fedmans are out. Phil, some hawkish language. Ooh, hawkish language in the Fed's minutes. Let's, all right. Let's see. I'm being lazy today. So I'm going to go, oh, 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 we're recovering. Going to go look at the Wall Street Journal. And see what they say about it. Because I don't feel like reading. Bitcoin falls as much as 30%. <laughs> so funny. Oh, my God. Oh, you poor bastards. See, like, how is this money? How can it be money if it goes up and down? <laughs> if, it go, if it can go May 18th, 43. May 19th, 38. You know, it, I, okay, I was going to buy a car for 54 Bitcoin, and now I can only buy uh, uh, half, half a car, 40 or 60% of a car. <laughs> it's down 40% since I since I went to the dealer and agreed to buy for Bitcoin. I now need to bit one and a half Bitcoins. 50. So basically, my cost went up 50%. <clears throat> or and obviously, car car dealers don't have the margins. That's why. That's why. Uh, Tesla said, oh, forget that. We can't accept Bitcoins to the cars. It changes. This is the uh, last week. What's today? 19th. Nine days ago. Yeah. Now that one's a little bit less. Uh, what day is it? Oh, here. Eight days. Eight days ago. 
that's a week. You go to the car dealership, you make a deal to get a car, you come back to sign the papers, and he's like, oh, no, we're not, we're not taking that. That's not money. That's not cool. You can't do that. Um, Fed officials say they're closely watching for the right model. Oh, 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 I see. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, central bank is speak publicly ahead of the minutes. Okay, so St. Louis Fed Bullard said, I don't think we're quite to that point. Bostic said, similar remarks. We're going to have to be very nimble in terms of monitoring the economy, said Bostic. Uh, this is not actually about the minutes. Oh, here's yelling bullshitting. Oh, that's funny. Second. Oh, see, little, I, see I, now, you know what the problem is? I don't think it's got volume. Watch. It's my expectation oh. that next year we'll be back to full employment. Um, there will certainly be some adjustments along. Oh, the I way. miss her. And a, a huge shift in spending all this money. away from services and toward durable goods and manufactured goods. And I expect as things open open up, uh, we'll see a shift in spending back in the other direction, some reallocation of workers as that occurs. Um, you know, for the next six months or so, I expect to see for transitory reasons, some price pressures, uh, but I think the causes are uh, transitory due to various bottlenecks um, and so-called base effects with respect to inflation indices. Uh, short run, uh, the demand for workers is increasing and many people still aren't able to return full time to work because they still have children out of school or are concerned about health issues. But I expect all of this to be transitory and I think the economy is going to get back on track. I don't anticipate that inflation is going to be a problem. But it is something that we're watching very carefully. So that three or four times that she said transitory, um, clearly that is a message from the Fed. Clearly that they they do not want you discussing or thinking or anything. It's a, it's a, what do you call it? Double think in 1984, right? It's like they do not want you in any way, shape, or form even thinking that inflation is anything but a temporary problem that will go away quickly. Um. India, oh, India hit a new world record. 4,500 deaths in one day. Wow. Wow, they beat our record. Oh, that is embarrassing. Trump has to get reelected now. <laughs> His old record has been shattered. Holy cow, I cannot believe Trump let this happen. How can he? How can how can they kill more people than than he did? We had four thousand four hundred seventy five on January twelfth. Damn, they beat us by by seventy five deaths. Ah, uh, I think we I think we need to recount. <laughs> demand a demand a recount. Nobody kills more people than Donald Trump. Let's see. All right, where are we? Wow, see, now you think I don't care about the minutes. The, the, uh, these guys don't even mention it. What is that? The zombie, she's a zombie. Oh, she's cool. All right. Da, 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 da. This is no good. So the, the, so, so the Wall Street Journal is ignoring the fact that the Fed even had minutes. Um, I guess we'll have to just look at it ourselves then. Gosh. Dan, 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 press conference. No, 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 April. Oh, oh, I see. I'm sorry. Minutes released today. Okay. Ah, uh, blah, 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 blah. Ha ha. Huh. Developments in the markets. Financial conditions ease modestly. Uh huh. Equity prices rose. Treasury yields, dollar spreads, equity gain. 
highly levered family investment office expected equity prices. Uh, no. Long-term treasury. Oh my God, is this boring? Expectations. Here we go. Um, expectations for policy outlook of the market survey implied past federal fund rates are both relatively little change over the intermediate period, and the modal survey past continued implied target range would gradually increase to a level just over two percent in 2026. Expect that doesn't sound bearish at all. Expectations for path of asset purchases were also stable. Market participants remain focused on the uh, central reserve. Blah blah blah. This is this is that's not bear. That's not that's not hawkish at all. Recent financial market developments across advanced companies offered expectations. Countries are expected to recoup uh, earlier than some in seen yields. Bank of Canada. Blah blah blah. Uh, next money markets balance sheet uh, increased. Blah blah blah. Uh, reserve balance is 3.9 trillion. Effective federal funds rate was steady at seven points. However. Ongoing strong demand for short-term investments reduced the treasury bill supply, secured overnight finance rates at one point. Uh, take up 100 billion, modest amount of overall trading, overnight repos, uh, negative rates, overnight repo, negative rates. <clears throat> da, 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 da. Few survey respondents, adjustment, managing included the update was three operational issues following blah, 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 That's bullshit. Company voted unanimously to renew the reciprocal, blah, blah, blah. So nothing happened. Uh, discussion of repo agreements. Repo operations have been a useful tool. Repo operations work together, blah, blah, blah. And their discussion, consideration, establishment, repo facility. Potential benefit of appropriately calibrated policy. Uh, as a result, promptly addressed issues. Few have notice the standing repo. Could provide counterparties. Oh my God, your standing repo perceived. Participants noted it would be important. Carefully consider key design elements. <clears throat> okay, so discussion of standing repo agreement. And their discussion relates to the establishment of permanent FEMA. The vast majority, a vast majority, that's when you pay attention. So the potential benefits outweighing the cost. So they do want to go into a permanent uh, repo facility. Uh, participants highlight a number of benefits, including blah, blah, blah. So just laying out all their reasons for doing it. Um, staff review, uh, COVID, GDP increased, the pace was fast in the fourth quarter, but did not return to pandemic level. See, that's the thing. We have this big 6% GDP bump, but we're still not at the level that we were before the pandemic because we dropped more than that. It's it only made up from before, but it's not like an increase overall. Labor market conditions improved in March. Employment was below the start of 2020. Consumer price inflation, uh, change in price <laughs> below 2%. That's already obviously bullshit. Non-farm payroll surge. Labor force participation. Average hourly earnings fell. Oh, no, four. I thought I said fell. Average hourly earnings for all employees rose 4.2% over the past 12 months. 12 months change average hourly earnings, concentration of jobs. Uh, I mean, that's that's impressive. Average hourly earnings rose 4.2% during the 12 months ended in March. So during COVID, earnings went up. Um, employment's down, but the money made by the people who are working went up. Medium wage, ADP was 3.1%. PC inflation, blah, blah, blah. It's bullshit. Everything to say about that is bullshit. Um... Existing home sales fell in February and March, maybe today too. Declines appear to be reflect limited availability of homes rather than weakening demand. Uh, February's drop in new homes. Average indicators suggested that equipment intangibles investment increased in the first quarter. Manufacturing, blah, blah, blah. Real government purchases, wide nominal incoming, uh, nothing, nothing. Um, investor sentiment improved. Straight read of overnight indexes, low 25, despite improvements. Lending standards for commercial, industrial, and consumer were tight. Um, broad stock prices increased. Outperformance tech stocks. One month implied volatility declined, approaching median level. Treasury yields modestly. Spreads on bonds, little change. Yields, domestic short term fund. So, not, not saying anything about the market. Domestic short term funding remains stable. Uh, Fed funds and rate with little change, blah, blah, blah. Factors stressed foreign financial markets. 
uh, renewed lockdowns were less concerning to global investors. Um, market option ten tempered by rising COVID cases, broad EME, little change, finance and conditions, finance conditions for non-commercial businesses and capital markets remain highly accommodative over the intermediate period as reflected low corporate bond yields, high PE ratios and equity markets, uh, gross bond issuance it says nothing. I don't know what people are reacting to. I don't see what this is. Economic projection is stronger. All right. Uh, projections are stronger than the March forecast. Real GDP growth was substantial. Uh, rapid decline in employment, further reductions in social distancing. Um, boosted growth continued. Uh, GDP growth was expected to step down in 2022 and 23. Staff's outlook for inflation was broadly unchanged. Uh, they don't change it especially dip slightly inflation was then projected to dip below two percent in 22 and 20. that's bullshit uh staff continues to judge the risk of baseline projection were skewed to the downside that's interesting the staff continued to judge that the risk to the baseline projection were skewed to the downside and uncertainty was elevated that's interesting <clears throat> in particular despite the demonstrated resilience of the economy to surges in the pandemic the possibilities covid variants were more contagious and more resistant to existing vaccines and would spread a salient downside risk. The staff continue to view the risk around inflation as balanced on the upside bottlenecks, uh, historically high, and the bottlenecks are a big deal. Historically high rates of resource utilization was seen as potential sources of greater than expected inflationary pressure. Alternatively, the possibility of inflation would be held down by the underlying trend inflation and a weaker than expected response was not seen as an important downside risk. Okay. All right, so 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 uh, you know basically they're kind of they're kind of looking at the GDP estimates, which I've said for a while though, and I've I've said that they're getting way ahead of themselves with these uh, upgrades to the GDP and economic outlook, not realistic, and especially given where we are now, we're in the second because this is the second quarter, guys, it's over, we're in the we're in the final month of the second quarter, and um, well June, and. Um, or, or let's say we're halfway through the second quarter and we're not at a hundred percent. And if we were at 70% last month and we're at 85% this month, and maybe we get to 95% in the third quarter, you're still having a subpar year. You're not going to make it all up by being at 125% in quarter four. This is not going to happen. So people are ahead of themselves in the market, basically, and we need a correction. These are these are we are overpriced for what's real. <clears throat> so we'll see what actually happens. All right, that's it. I'm starting to lose my voice. Ain't what it used to be, unfortunately. Let's see if you have any extra questions. Nope, nope, nope. I'm ready for the minutes. <laughs> We're number two, says Randy. Very good. All right. So Otherwise, oh, I, I was going to talk about the portfolios. Uh, all right, we'll talk about the portfolios during the week. Look, here's the bottom line. We went over the uh, earnings portfolio yesterday. This is the, the uh, butterfly portfolio today. Especially in this kind of market, you don't have to take a big risk, okay? I mean, if you, you know, if you look at these portfolios, let's take a nice simple one. The simple little portfolio. Um, well, all right, dividend portfolio. Now, the dividend portfolio we started 1025.19. We only ever expected to make 30 40% a year in the dividend portfolio. So, here we are, um, or not quite you know, 18 months into it, and we're at 82%. We're right on track, it's exactly where it should be. Um, Probably a little bit higher than that because I haven't put in the, the, the dividends that were paid out this quarter haven't been put in yet. Um, very simple stuff though. Look, it's a covered call. These are the non, these are not the crazy plays. These are not risky plays. These are very, very safe, <coughs> basic positions that we take. So the the first, the second half companies mostly um, we pay ourselves a dividend. Okay, by 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 
uh, selling calls or whatever because some of these companies don't pay dividends or whatever. In the first section here, these guys do pay dividends, so we're very happy with them the way they are. And we're not going for big numbers, but still in 18 months, we're up 82%. And, and and you think it wouldn't be because you look at these trades and they don't look like you're like, okay, two harbors. We bought them for 430. We sold the five dollar calls, four dollar. So what's our net? Our net is 330, right? If we get called away at five dollars, and I don't even know where two harbors is right now. So here's two harbors and seven. So we bought them um, in May of 2020. So it won't be on that chart, but we bought them for 430. It's a REIT, you know. It's a it's a REIT that I like, and I and, and I want and and uh, it pays a nice dividend. So um, and, or it did anyway. I don't know if it still does. T oh, probably still does. T W O. <laughs> Yeah, 10%, 9.44%. So boring little thing, two harvests. It was low. We bought it. We covered it very, very uh, conservatively with the December calls. It's pretty much the same time we bought them. And so we have a net 330, means we're going to make 170. Oops, sorry. So, so, um, 170 divided by 330 is 51%. There's a 51% upside at $5, where we're going to get called away in December. And we bought them in May of last year. So this whole thing was, was supposed to be an 18-month hold, and it is going to be an 18-month hold. We are going to get called away. But meanwhile, we're collecting a 10% dividend while we wait also. So in 18 months, we're going to make 51% when we called away at 5, and we're going to make uh you know probably uh let's say nine let's say 15 percent more in dividend 65 percent stupid little conservative trade that let's uh Ugh. So when are we buying? May of last year. So when things crashed, they they were lower. They were two bucks. Didn't mind then. But when they got around here, they looked like they were stabilizing. We've played this company before. We already know it. We already know we liked them at ten. We have played. You know, we played. We paid them in the well, paid them played them in the past, and we knew that this was stupidly cheap. So once things stabilized a little bit, didn't jump right in, which you guys, some people are talking to me about that today, like with uh, at and and whatever. You don't jump right in the second it starts falling. You don't know where it's going to stop falling. You don't know when people are going to get sick of selling it. But once it stabilizes and starts moving back up, we were perfectly comfortable here. And so we bought it for 430. Where'd they go? So we bought it for 430, somewhere in that range in there. And we sold it, or in May it was actually. So in right, right around there, we bought it for 430. But then we said, well, you know what? Maybe they go lower, whatever. So we sold the five dollar calls. The five it's at 430. We sold the five dollar calls right there for December of the next year, which is going to be out to here. And we collected a dollar for selling them. So that means our basis now is 330 which is lower than it was at any time except for the stupid spike that we knew was ridiculous. So now our basis is 330. We're going to get still paid our commission, our, um, our dividends while we wait. And anything above five, we get called away and we're done. And that, and what we said is 65% in two years, makes 30 something percent per year. This is what I'm trying to get up, get across in these portfolios, and this is this is why we've kept these portfolios long term. Usually we 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 trash them and start again, but I want to hammer home the the point I was trying to make the last two years is 
if you just let these things go, instead of messing around constantly and always looking for new trades, or whatever, if you just pick some good stocks, stick with them and let them play out, these are really powerful tools to make a huge amount of money. So that one makes 60%. Enterprise Partners is a, a similar trade in, in December of 2020. Oh, and, and another very important thing. Look when we add these things, okay? We started this portfolio in, um, in October 2019. How often do we add things? One month here, 2020. Here's 2019. That was added in 2019. This is added a year later. This is added also in November of 2019. So the when we started the portfolio, we added a few. Here's 2921, 10 1 2020, 10 19, 10 19, um, 4 21, 10 20, 3 21, 10 25, 10. And this is not an active portfolio at all. We only buy something when it gets cheap. And if it takes three months, six months of waiting before we find something to buy, we wait. If we see three things to buy because they're cheap this month, we buy them. But we don't feel compelled to rush in. The money will come. If you only buy great value stocks and you only buy them when they're well-priced, the money will come to you eventually. You don't have to force it. You don't have to settle. You don't have to do any of those things. So we have energy, enterprise products, energy transfer, uh, Investco. But look how conservative these trades are. We bought this for $15.92. We sold the $15 calls, lower than the price we bought it for. We uh, bought this for $8.13. We sold the $5 calls. So the $5 calls against the stock because we knocked the, the basis down, went from eight to six, sold these suckers for five bucks, these puts. So that's where we took the real chance on getting a sign more. Uh, it's 15, so you know, let's say it took $3 off. So we basically, basically our net here is 313 and we're getting called away at five, same thing. It's gonna be 60 something percent profit getting called away at five. We're happy with that, plus the dividends. Invesco, we bought it for 13. We sold the $15 calls. Ooh, we were really bullish on them, and I guess we were right, it's at 26 now. Um, Altria, we bought it for 46. We sold the 47.50 calls. Pfizer, bought it for 34, sold the $30 calls. We sold the calls lower than strike, but what else did we do? We sold the puts, so we drop our basis from 34 uh basically down 10 bucks so basically it's like a 24 dollars so again our basis is 24 we get called away at 30 with a six dollar profit that's 25 percent plus the dividend that's what we're in this for the dividends that's all we're doing just a bunch of nice little trades that make us money now part of the trick of this thing why so why is the portfolio up more than if we have all these trades that make 25 30 percent a year why are we up so much because we're leveraging because we're we're buying a lot more stock than we would have bought otherwise and we could have bought with if we just had that amount of money we wouldn't have done it and by the way this dividend portfolio this was the most in trouble portfolio we had we had to add a hundred thousand dollars to it it started with a hundred went down to 50 during the crash in march we added another 100, took it out of the long-term portfolio, and um, and, uh, now we, and now we've got, um, and now we came back in, in uh, very good shape. But this was actually, this is actually from $50,000 in, well, from 150,000 in March, we're now at 365, so we've doubled this year. So that was another big factor in this portfolio. The reason we have these outside outsized gains is because we doubled, instead of getting out of the portfolio with a 50% loss, we doubled down with a 50% loss and uh, picked up some very nice positions coming back. And then in fact, those are the ones we've already closed a lot of them because we made so much money. Um, but look at the conservative type of entries we do. And that also is why, that was why we were able to make those adjustments though, because we had very conservative positions. We made a ton of money on the short puts and um i'm sorry in the short calls and that allowed us to double down and sell more calls 
And even though we were very conservative about it, we put very little cash to work, but had tremendous leverage on it. Here's Macy's. Macy's totally took off on us. Ford uh, also took off on us. We sold the $7 calls on Ford, the $5 calls on Ford. Uh, NLY also took off. NLY, we, we didn't have cover though, so they're in good shape. Uh, Pet Med, we sold the, uh, the tw well, the, we took away the calls on the Pet Med. Pet Med dropped back, actually. Um, Pfizer, uh, Signet Jewelers came ripping back on us. Um, we sold the $30 calls there like at 60 bucks. Uh, Tang Tanger Factory Outlet, um, that one totally took off also. It's a 16. Simon Property is double where we expected it to be. And a good old AT&T, we had not covered it, but we're still, we're behind on that too. Now 5,000 bucks because why? <laughs> the one we weren't conservative on, we're down. We should have we should have sold calls. We didn't sell calls. I, I think probably at some point we did, but we bought them back. But that's the problem. That's what happens. We didn't have protection. It went down, and now we're down eight thousand bucks on that one. But all these stocks, as you see, none of them are like strange companies. These are all basic, regular, good old American companies, solid corporations, making good money, and we don't bet them to go very far. We just bet them not to go down and to pay us our dividends. And if they do go down, because we sold puts, because we sold calls, we have flexibility to adjust our position and ride it out. And that's the key. You gotta have cash on the sidelines to ride things out with. Very, very important. So, you know, that's what we're talking about this month is how we build these portfolios and put it together. And you gotta just sometimes look at it and say, well, what the hell am I doing? Why are people, why am I, why am I in chat talking about these, these companies that have hundred times earnings and people say, what do you think about buying this? And what do you think about buying that for a hundred times earnings? I'm like, I don't think it's a good idea. I don't do it. I don't know why people always ask me, what do you think? It's like, well, have you ever seen me do that? I don't get into those companies. And it doesn't stop us from making fantastic money in the portfolios. It doesn't. And that's what you really got to realize. And that's why I'm trying to keep these things running to try to show you. It's like, if you just buy these boring, boring companies and play them correctly and set up option strategies, they're, it, the returns are exciting. The companies aren't exciting, but the returns sure are. All right. Um, So Robin says he's a trend watcher member. Oh, hi, Robin. How's it going? Good. So you can't see the chat. That's good. Um, and, and Wayne says, gold, why are you so bullish on gold? Won't gold fall if the market corrects, assuming a correction is coming? Not if it's falling because of inflation. I think, I, 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 you know, gold, I think, is, um, I mean, sure, it can, it can knock back a bit. Obviously, if the whole market falls, gold will fall, oil will fall. But overall, I think inflation is the issue. I think the, the amount of money the Fed has out there it's not it's a genie you can't put back in the bottle and and uh and and gold traditionally will hold its value against inflation and it's a good hedge to be in and and i'm not so bullish on gold the the stock gold yes i like them because they're a miner and they make money selling gold and they've got a lot of gold it's an undervalued asset in their portfolio and i think they're going to do very well and i think this year is going to be inflationary year it should be good for them i think i think in no way and their earnings are coming up very shortly. In no way are we recognizing the difference from last year to this year in gold. Um, he's throwing out the company, Barrett Gold. Oops. So Barrett Gold, earnings are, uh, that's dividends. Earnings are, oh, oh, they had earnings already, shit. I don't know what happened. All right. Well, anyway, um, apparently they had earnings. I missed it. But anyway, so Barrett Gold. So why do I think Barrett Gold should do well? Well, mostly because if you go to the chart for gold, and I say to myself, okay, so 
they sell gold. And they sell basically the same 5 million ounces every year. So last year in May, April, gold was $1,700 an ounce. And it was actually lower in the quarter. So it started out lower, probably averaged 1650 maybe uh, for the first quarter of last year, for the, I'm sorry, the second quarter of last year. So in the second quarter of last year, gold was here. The thing is, gold is down from the first quarter a bit. First quarter, we're here. We average here, obviously, in the first quarter, 18. Here, we're averaging probably a bit under 18, but it's rising again. But the comparison, really, for earnings is going to be to, to last year. And last year, we were about 1650. Now, did their costs go up considerably? No, their costs probably did not go up more than 10%, probably not even 10%. Yet, the uh, uh, the price they're selling it for, their final price, is up at like uh, at least 18. So a, a good 10% increase in the price that they're selling it for. Therefore, they will make more money this quarter than they made in the first quarter of last year. And they're starting the next quarter at a much higher price than they started. So here's, here's the next quarter, we end, we end in July. So if this quarter stays above 18, which it probably will, they're going to have a, a better quarter here than they had last this quarter last year. And then if July starts above 18, they're in better shape in July. It might not spike up as much in August and, and September, but they're going to have another good year. A very solid year. And gold, and Barrick made um, They made $2.3 billion last year. They're only they're they're projecting $2 billion this year. They didn't project that they would do as well this year as they did last year, but they're probably going to do better. Um they're only they're selling for $44 billion. So you have a, a $2.3 billion, $44 billion, so basically 20 times earnings. Okay, for the for the miner. They also though what you don't what you don't realize with the gold miner is it's not like um uh, it's not like Coca-Cola where they've got a factory with some equipment of dubious value to anybody else and blah, blah, blah. This is gold. They've got gold. Their asset is gold in the ground. They've got 70 million ounces of gold in the ground. They have an, oh, and copper. I forgot about copper. Yeah, they, they're, they're, they, they also sell a lot of copper. And the copper that they sell, here, here's a comparison that'll blow your mind. Look at the copper futures. So last year they were selling copper for 250. Now they're selling copper all quarter long for more than four dollars. And again, did the extraction cost go up? No. So even if you say forget, even if you say, well, this won't last, so forget the, what's in the ground. We're not going to count that as being worth more. They have incredible amounts of copper in the ground, but the copper that they're selling. Is selling it's all profit when when it was 250 they were making money selling copper now it's four dollars they're making an extra dollar fifty a pound selling copper they are going to make a lot of money that's a very simple premise there's nothing complicated about it all right guys oh now it's three o'clock anyway <laughs> all right well thanks so much for coming i appreciate it and we'll uh do this again next week all right take care everybody